This video is supported by CuriosityStream and the streaming platform I co-founded, Nebula. Stay tuned till the end to find out how to get both for only $15 for a year, but also to experience my own attempt at ASMR, which you definitely do not want to miss. Now, I've been using YouTube for a decade or so now and making videos seriously on here for about two years. But ensconced in my little educational YouTube bubble, I've managed to avoid a lot of the stranger corners of the platform. One term I was familiar with for a long time was ASMR, but my sole example of it was a video of an extremely attractive woman dressed as a doctor, frankly, molesting a microphone in what I inferred to be a seductive way. I thought this is weird and cringy, and if I wanted to watch good-looking people dress up as healthcare professionals and make noises, well, there are other websites for that. But recently I was looking for a clinical skills video. In medicine, this is what we call a tutorial video about some examination or something like that. Examining the heart, the eyes, cranial nerves, you know, you get the idea. And most of these videos are pretty niche. They're really only gonna be looked up by medical students or junior doctors, but I noticed some had a lot of views, like a lot, millions. What was going on? So I investigated. Some of them weren't even uploaded by medical channels, but by ASMR channels. For those of you only vaguely as familiar with ASMR as I was a few weeks ago, you might be asking, hang on, what actually is it? ASMR as a term was only coined about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, and it stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. It can be defined in several different ways, but generally regarded as a relaxing or enjoyable feeling, perhaps accompanied by a tingling sensation often described around the head. Triggers can be varied, but frequently include speaking softly, personal care, pleasant sounds, and many more. Intentional ASMR, in terms of YouTube video making, is where you, people set out to make videos to generate the desired effect, whereas unintentional ASMR is where viewers derive the same pleasurable experience from a video of a process that has some other purpose. As far as I can tell, the difference between the intentional and unintentional ASMR crowds is the third biggest divide in humanity since the Great Schism of 11th century Christianity, closely followed by the violent civil war of Yanni and Laurel. Examples of unintentional ASMR that I found include suit fitting, hairstyling, makeup application, ear clean, cleaning, head lice checks, what the hell, videos from familiar faces like Bob Rogers, <laughs> like Bob Ross or Fred Rogers, calmly speaking, and of course, lots and lots of medical checkups. Like a woodland animal discovering a furry convention, I was confused by all these people dressing up like me and doing kinky things. Now, I know that a frequent complaint from the ASMR community is, is that it's labeled as a sexual thing when it isn't, and I accept that. But doctors just don't look like this, frankly. We're not this good looking. Let's take a look through all these medical ASMR checkups. You can clearly see that there is a gender bias here. Aha, finally some representation for us marginalized minority men. Wow, medical checkups in space. I mean, some of these are pretty inventive. Cranial nerve exams are very popular. They involve the head, which is a common sort of ASMR trigger, so that makes sense. And our eyes are just not producing enough oil these days. Wait a second. What the f- are you taking the piss? Well, actually, it seems like quite another bodily fluid that she's after. Jazzy ASMR. I mean, she maybe looks like she could be Indian, perhaps. So, um, you know, she probably is a doctor in real life. Now, I know this isn't a medical ASMR video, and there are many weird and wacky ASMR videos that I could pick on out there, but when looking for personal care ASMR, I found it's this- quiet. Work of art is really the only way I can describe it. Isn't it wonderful? Which I had to share. Yes, it's Shrek boyfriend roleplay. When I see something like this, I do wonder if the pandemic really was actually punishment sent down by the gods, for humanity hath strayed from the divine path and into depravity and no longer deserves to enjoy Earth's bounties. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm hating on the intentional ASMR medical crowd. It's just not for me. I'm sure they'd understand why a doctor would find it hard to watch someone talk medical gibberish. If I wanted to do that, I could just watch The Resident. But then again, if you consider the unintentional ASMR, I mean, I've always quite enjoyed watching artisan videos, a master craftsperson sculpting or carving a work of art. But I don't know if I'm just appreciating their expertise and a nice video. Is that ASMR? One of the difficult things about studying ASMR is that it's quite hard to define what it is and whether it's the same to different people. And in my opinion, this can lead to very problematic content being shrugged off as ASMR when it should be looked at objectively as harmful. Mukbang channels where people 
glamorize disordered binge eating and waste appalling amounts of food are sometimes justified under the ASMR category. Although I can't imagine what is relaxing about watching, or worse, hearing people eating like they've been starved for days. Chiropractors cracking joints is a hugely popular genre of video that people overwhelmingly describe as satisfying. But these sensationalist videos of patients that have come to the practitioners for help, but instead find their medical problem the centerpiece of pseudoscientific theater, inculcate acceptance of quackery. Chiropractic has no basis in science, and it's never been shown to be superior to physical therapy. Surprisingly, for something so prevalent online, there's not much research focusing on it. But one of the leading scientists looking into ASMR is Dr. Julia Poerio from the University of Essex. Julia, thanks so much for joining me. Um, I'll just go ahead and start with the headline question. Is ASMR real? It's not something that everybody experiences. Um, but it is something that is genuine. So um, we've got uh, research now showing that there are physiological changes um, associated with the ASMR response. So when people who claim that they have ASMR, this is a kind of tingling sensation, when they watch videos that are intended to induce that feeling, um, they show uh, substantial reductions in their heart rate, which is consistent with this idea that ASMR is something that's relaxing. Picking up on that point about not everybody being affected, have you identified any characteristics that are common to the kinds of people that tend to experience ASMR? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So um, some other groups have looked at um, the relationship with personality traits. So it seems to be um, quite strongly related to openness to experience as a personality trait. Um, it's also associated with um, other complex emotional experiences like music induced chills. So these are the chills that some people get, but not everybody, um, where they listen to certain uh, pieces of music and they get the kind of goosebumps, the hair standing on end. Um, so those things uh, appear to be associated. ASMR is also more commonly associated with something called misophonia, uh, which literally means hatred of sound. So this is kind of um, an experience or a condition where people uh, experience extreme kind of anger and irritation at certain sounds like um, chewing sounds. Actually, quite a lot of sounds that are ASMR um, mm. induced as well, which is quite interesting for other reasons. So there's this idea that potentially people with ASMR um, have heightened sensory sensitivities. From our research, what we know is that there seems to be this kind of um, this interesting pattern of physiological responding in which you, you're getting a re reduction in heart rate, but you're also getting an increase in skin conductance response. So you're getting this kind of mixed emotional kind of um, response that is also reflected in people's subjective thoughts. So people's, people are telling us that they're feeling re relaxed, but also activated at the same time. Um, and this points to the kind of emotional complexity of ASMR. So as somebody who's interested in emotions, um, you know, we normally think about emotions as being represented in a space that, that comprises valence, um, so positivity or negativity and arousal. Um, so, so the idea that it's both arousing and deactivating at the same time is something that's quite interesting from the perspective of um, emotional complexity. A frequent theme that I've noticed in ASMR videos and triggers is that of personal care. And one of the things I read, and I realize this is kind of getting into speculative territory here, but whether that was linked to grooming behaviors that are seen in other primates, do you think there's anything to that? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, so I, I don't like to um, speculate on kind of those kinds of things. It's not really within my area of expertise, but there's a, there's a couple of things that I would say. Um, people often forget that ASMR is something that is experienced in real life. Um, and that the videos are intended to be a simulation of circumstances mm. that would trigger ASMR naturally. Um, touch is one of the biggest ASMR triggers, um, which obviously it just doesn't happen because, um, when you're watching it on screen. Um, so touch is probably the, the main ASMR trigger, um, or one of the main ones. Um, but what I find really interesting about the relationship with touch is that um, what you're essentially getting is a tactile-like response because you're getting this sort of tingling sensation on the scalp that's like a head massage, um, but you're getting that from auditory or visual stimuli. So mm. this is kind of synesthetic type um, response that's going on. And um, so we we are sort of speculating at the moment, and we, we plan to test this when we can um, that. 
there is a link between the benefits that people get from ASMR and the benefits that people get from social touch and affective touch, different kinds of touch. Much has been made of ASMR's popularity in our dramatically isolated modern world. And obviously the pandemic has made social isolation much worse than before. But even before the pandemic, there was talk of an epidemic of loneliness. And I wondered whether you think that those could be uh, related? Oh, that's a good question. Um, something I've wondered, you know, um, in our 2018 study, we looked we, we looked at social connectedness and whether that increased after watching ASMR videos, and it did. So there's certainly an element of, of ASMR is something that could potentially, um, you know, increase feelings of social connection. Now, whether or not that is... A good thing, I, I don't know. So I guess there's two two ways to think about this. The first is that if you have a substitute for something that you're not getting in your real life, like a snack, as it were, um, then that that's good because it might tide you over until you can actually have like a meal. On the other hand, what it might do is highlight and intensify feelings of disconnection. So it might inadvertently, even if you're seeking out for social connection, be something that you go, oh, but actually, I'm not getting this in my real life. So the idea that something like ASMR might be universally beneficial or something like loneliness, I think, is something that really needs to be, needs unpicking. ASMR isn't a cure for loneliness. Um, it might help, um, but it's not. Um, it, we really need meaningful social connection. Um, and, and this isn't something that happens. But you see it all the time. I mean, there's a whole literature on parasocial relationships, you know, um, and I think this is increasingly common with, you know, YouTube stars and social media in, in which people feel an attachment to people that they've never even met. Sort of expanding on the possible uses of ASMR, my interest in this started when I noticed how often uh, medical consultations seem to come up in ASMR videos. So that got me thinking whether there might be any kind of potential for this to be used in a therapeutic way. It's interesting. So going back to talking about what we're talking about in terms of brain scanning. So before I used to get participants into the fMRI machine, I used to send them a video of somebody being put into an MRI machine and so they could hear the sounds and they could, you know, see what it was like. And there's this idea that in some sense that might prepare them and, and reduce anxiety because they know what to expect. It might be that what ASMR is doing for some people in certain contexts is it, it's reducing anxiety for certain situations like going to the doctors or going to the dentist. You know, dentist role plays are really common, mm. um, which I find um, funny because a lot of people don't like going to the dentist. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, it might be taking certain um, social situations that would be difficult, taking them out of the, the emotional context uh, and making it more kind of what more calming and easier to deal with i actually think that what's probably happening is that these are the kind of scenarios that would trigger asmr in, in real life and so that's why they have kind of infiltrated into yeah. um, online asmr world so there's something about somebody paying close personal attention to you but they're not really interested in you they're interested in a part of you and i think that is what is triggering um about ASMR is that it's a level of intimacy and personal interest, but it isn't really about you. There's a level of anonymity about it. So a doctor is interested in you as the patient, but they're interested in a very specific part of you, like looking at your eye or testing your cranial nerves or, or whatever it is. And they're not, it's not really about you. So there's this sense of intimacy that can kind of be depersonalized and anonymized um, that I think is, is quite central to ASMR. I really enjoyed chatting with Julia and our conversation went on for quite a bit longer, a good 20 minutes or so. So if you want to see the full thing, head on over to Nebula where I've posted a significantly extended cut of this video. Look, when it comes to psychology and neuroscience, I'm out of my depth here. But the reason Julia's studies were very interesting and useful is because they used a control group. Now, a thought I had was why not stick people uh, inside an MRI scanner and see what's going on in their brains. And another team did look at ASMR with fMRI scanning, but without a control group. So I'm not really sure how to interpret the results. That would be true irrespective of what they were testing, but especially so with MRI, because some people find them quite unpleasant. Meanwhile, I've undergone MRI scans for my knee and my back, plus a couple of much longer ones as part of my PhD. And I actually found them very relaxing and completely fell asleep in two of them. And it's hard to discriminate whether tingles would be intrinsic or extrinsic in an MRI scanner because it's quite normal to have 
tingling sensation caused by the electromagnetic field. Hey, maybe my ASMR requires an enormous 2 million pound 3 Tesla MRI scanner, which is somewhat impractical and expensive to say the least. Well, clearly a second channel beckons where I make videos pretending to put people in an MRI scanner. I'll call it ASMRI. So I'm starting to understand this a bit better. I definitely now know that feeling that people talk about. If I get a head massage, I can be knocked out like a light, but I don't seem to get it virtually. Yet clearly some people do through a screen. Now I'm pretty skeptical about some of the science that's been collated at ASMR University, a website set up to try and coordinate research into the field. Let's just say a lot of it is much more wishy-washy than Julia's and is anecdotal or speculative. So the jury's out on the actual health benefits as of yet, but clearly it seems to help some people. And so does the mechanism really matter? So with all these medical consultations forming a large part of ASMR videos online, what can I, as a doctor, learn from ASMR's potential beneficial effect? I don't think there's a better person to ask than a veritable legend in ASMR circles, as well as a practicing doctor, Dr. James Gill, a man described in YouTube comments as the Bob Ross of medicine. Hi, James, thanks so much for, for joining me. Um, you're actually my sort of portal into this whole world because I was looking up clinical skills videos and found one of yours. And initially I was very excited and delighted that millions of people were interested in learning how to examine the cardiovascular system. I mean who can blame them? But um, then I started thinking, actually, maybe there's something else going on here. When did you figure out that actually, maybe not all the people watching are medical students or medical professionals, and, and some people are watching for other reasons? It was actually a couple of years ago, we were, I was having a Christmas dinner, believe it or not, with my friends. And one of them was saying that he was listening, trying to get some videos and stuff to help him sleep. And, you know, his room's dark, he's lying there in bed. And suddenly my voice came through his computer monitor, which obviously stopped him going to sleep. And he found out what was going on and, you know, then told us about it the following day. Now, the thing is, I'd done those original videos for the medical school, thrown them that way, never thought about them again. I'd not looked at the numbers. It was just a, a job that was done. Um, so we were completely blown away and just randomly loading up YouTube and looking at what had happened over the preceding year or so with absolutely no intervention from anybody. And, and how did you start figuring out what was actually going on? Did you get comments or any, receive any messages? I was just looking over the comments and seeing what people had said and the surprising things uh, that were there. The, the thing that came over to myself um, was, yeah, there was this, there's obviously the medical students getting the benefit from it, but there seemed to be this recurring theme that people were using them to relax, which you know, I don't know about yourself, but I'm utterly terrified of going to the dentist. And my, my GP, I was actually at medical school with him. He's a great guy, but you know, I, professionally, I like to avoid him. Yeah. So the concept of people wanting to watch medical videos was very interesting, shall we say. What's your sort of understanding of ASMR and in particular how it may play a part in your clinical work? We're all aware of the doctor as a drug and particularly in general practice, sometimes you'll have a patient that's very worried, anxious, they need reassurance and you'll go that little bit further in examining them. You'll pull out more of the bells and whistles that we don't routinely do, but we were educated on. Sorry. <laughs> Let me redo that again. But they are also, from a, an emotional perspective, they know that they have been examined completely. And I think that there is that crossover with laying hands on people. You know, why is it that physio done on Zoom at the moment with advising someone to do the correct stretches has less of a benefit than the physio doing the same thing face to face, helping the person do those movements and putting hands on. You know, we're a very social species. And part of that where the people are doing role plays, but they're sort of examining the camera. So it feels mm -hmm. like the person is being examined. I think it's about 
contact. It's about a connection with somebody. I did tell one of my friends who's a science YouTuber with a pretty big audience and a self-confessed fan of medical ASMR. He requested, he remain anonymous by the way, that I was going to talk to James and he was really excited. I asked him what he gets from James's videos. And he replied that they just send him straight to sleep, which might sound like an insult to a regular person, but to a YouTuber, falling asleep while watching a video is wonderful for view time. Hey, hey, wake up. I'm obviously the wrong audience to appreciate the ASMR qualities of a medical video because it just feels like work to me. But maybe that in itself is a lesson. Here are people all over the world dressing up and performing the job that I do in a kind of act. Now that's something fundamentally different from when I fantasize about taking the first steps on Mars or captaining a pirate ship of the undead. I'm doing that for my own enjoyment. What they're doing is to be enjoyed by others. So there's something in what I do that has this significance. It's a kind of ritual that has an effect on people. Nowadays, we have such advanced scans easily available. We have ample information about a patient's condition without going anywhere near them. But even if I'm about to consult their scan results, I always listen to their heart and their lungs, feel their pulse, look at their neck and so on. Part of that is just to keep my eye in, or rather my ear in, to stay in touch because I teach these skills the same way James does. But when junior doctors ask me why I bother, I say it's because it's what the patient expects. There's an element of theater to, to what we do. A patient might be told repeatedly that their scan shows their abdominal pain is not worrying, but there's something incredibly reassuring about an experienced surgeon laying their hands on the patient and telling them calmly they're okay. Unfortunately, I fear, fear that uh, COVID has made this many times worse than it was. I occasionally get referred patients that are entirely well. There's literally nothing wrong with them, but I still go through all the motions because I know that the act of me doing that is important to them, feeling that they have been assessed properly. How this overlaps with the medical ASMR phenomenon, I don't know. I'd really love to hear your views on ASMR, not just ASMR videos, but the phenomenon itself. I hope you think I've given it a fair assessment. Now I have, given ASMR a crack myself. I don't mean to brag, but I think you'll get some serious tingles, so stay tuned to the end of the video to watch. But before that, I come to you from a beardless future where facial hair has been outlawed. Curiosity Stream and Nebula have been consistently and generously supporting me so I can continue making these more esoteric and to me more interesting and fun videos than the non-sponsored ones in between, which are obviously mostly about COVID. And I made a decision right at the start that I wouldn't have any of those sponsored, but they're important and I want to keep making them. So I really appreciate the support from Curiosity Stream and Nebula um, sponsoring my videos. And if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash medlife and use my code medlife, you can get a whole year of Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $15, which will give you and me some brain tingles. Nebula is the streaming platform I co-founded with a bunch of educational creators that you already know. It's where we can put content that might not work on YouTube, or we can put extra content, like for this video, the extended interviews with Julia and James, or Nebula Originals, things like Joe Scott's new series on the mysteries of the human body, which looks fantastic, or Extra History's excellent video on Tipu Sultan. Curiosity Stream is where you find thousands upon thousands of high quality documentaries about science, history, art, space, tech, and loads more. Now it's taken me quite a few months to edit this video in little five minute snatches that I get here and there. But over that time and reading about ASMR, I've started getting a bit more into psychology. And coupled with the fact that I mentioned um, neurodiversity in the Q&A video I uh, made a little while ago, and it really seemed to resonate with a lot of people. I've got messages and comments that I've really enjoyed reading. So I've been exploring Curiosity Stream's section on the mind and trying to get more into that. And I really loved one documentary called The Brain Factory about some crazy fools who are on a mission to upload the human brain into a computer like they didn't watch a single episode of Black Mirror. So if you want to support this channel, the best way is to sign up for Curiosity Stream and Nebula and get yourself access to all of those titles on both platforms for only $15, which is 26% off the normal price. And we all know that 26% off is more than 25% off. That is science. Link below. Hi, my name is Dr. M. Crisis. I understand you're here for your test results. Let's get right to that. I just want to ensure you're totally relaxed, calm, 
everything's going to be okay. Before we begin, I wish to inform you that I've asked two of the hospital's lawyers to join us. Totally routine. So let's get to those results. You scored exceedingly highly. Well done. I've never seen a score this high. In... Cancer markers, yes, a high score is is not what we want here. Actually, you you have a fungating tumour that has riddled your entire body. It's a wonder you're even conscious. Your brain tissue is, at this point, sludge. You have over 600 medical disorders nine separate terminal diseases, each of which is catastrophic, and four conditions that have just been discovered in you, and before you take comfort in the fact that Mr. Burns's diseases were in perfect balance in the skit that I'm riffing on now, in your case, each disease simply exacerbates the one before. Please, c- could you sign this consent form? It's not for treatment. It's so that I can write you up as a case report in the New England Journal of Medicine. How long do you have? Well, I owe you that much, to be honest. Let me check the calendar. Well, today is Tuesday, so based on the treatment program that I'd like to propose, I'd say you've got three, two, one... (laughs) 